Hello class, we're watching a video today, so shut your face and pay attention, because I'm only going to say this once. Well, I mean, technically you can just rewatch the video, but you know, SHUT UP! STOP TRYING TO OUTLOGIC ME! What you're now watching is a small clip from part 5 of a 1980s BBC series called Secret Societies, an expose by the famed journalist Duncan Campbell into Britain's, well, secret societies, in particular a vast number of Secret societies, all with edgy sounding initials. Initials like Gen 5, SEP, MISC 21, GOP, PZZZZ, and MISC 37, and of course, E. These were all used by the then British Conservative Party, the ruling body at the time, but unfortunately still this time, because apparently we haven't learned our fucking lesson. Move away from legal restrictions and allow people to make their own informed decisions. <laughs> We will allow all businesses to reopen, including nightclubs. We will lift the limit on named visitors to care homes and on numbers of people attending concerts, theatre and sports events. The United Kingdom has recorded the highest number of Covid deaths in a 24-hour period since the pandemic struck last year. We will end the one metre plus rule on social distancing and the legal obligation to wear a face covering. And that brings the UK total to 120,365. Actually, there's no press here. What do you mean there's no press here? Who are these people? So these secret initiatives were used by the government to dictate policy on various issues like the economy, worker strikes, foreign relations, wars the sexual preference of your cabinet ministers. They formed part of Britain's dark, emu, edgy, black budget, and while many of them were fairly mundane in their operations, some were not. The documentary went on to expose many of these initiatives, their attempts to deceive the public, government, Britain's allies, as well as the huge amount of money being poured into the money which at the time was being pulled from vital sectors of British infrastructure, leading to mass privatisations, shortages, worker strikes, riots, dead children, all that kind of fun stuff. Parts 1 to 4 aired as normal, however part 5 of the documentary was pulled from broadcast before it could be fully aired. The offices where it were produced were raided, the producer was arrested, his wife was looked at very sternly, and also raided, and a large number of papers and film wheels were confiscated. It wouldn't be until January 1987 when British newspaper The Observer would break the story defying a media gag order that all of it would come to light. It became a national scandal and proved to be one of the biggest turning points in relations between the BBC and the government. The government attempted to sue the producer, a man called Duncan Campbell, however after he was interviewed by the New Statesman magazine, the case fell apart. The BBC controller who had commissioned the documentary was forced to resign, and the word Zircon entered public knowledge. The word which had previously been considered so top secret, saying it out loud could have had you arrested. Part 5 of the documentary was eventually aired two years later, albeit somewhat modified, and Part 6, titled Cabinets, has never been aired and remains locked within the BBC's film vault, never to be seen again. But what exactly is Zircon? To find that out, you're going to need a brief lesson on British intelligence, and that will be brief. During the Cold War, a secret second war was being played out, a war of spies, espionage, intelligence gathering, covert operations, secret gadgets, suave gentlemen, femme fatales, and mass deceptions, you know, stuff your dad gets excited about. Two massive powers were fighting in a war to which neither side was prepared to fire the first shot, as doing so could not guarantee victory and quite possibly end in nuclear annihilation, which, in spite of what many of you were brought up to believe, was something neither side really wanted. So instead, the Cold War was played out in secret. In Britain, one of the most sophisticated intelligence gathering and counterintelligence agencies was starting to take roots. Originating from the Boer War of 1889, Britain began to employ specialised intelligence officers. These were people tasked not with gathering information but disseminating it, reading between the lines of scout reports and trying to work out what Johnny Foreigner was up to. Because they're clever like that, don't you know? Uh, although the service was disbanded after the war, Lieutenant Colonel David Henderson from the uh, it it's capitalised in my script. I I don't know why, I think I was trying to emphasise just how badass this man was, you know. Lieutenant Colonel David Henderson from the Arctic Island, Southern Highland is how I imagine he he speaks. I wrote the manual entitled Field Intelligence, Its Principles and Practice in 1904. 
This became the founding manual for many of Britain's intelligence agencies, known under the collective term military intelligence, split into six different sections, although their foundations are not in numerical order. They are as follows. One. Known more commonly as Room 40, that was set up during the First World War and dealt with code breaking. It would later become known as GCHQ and live in this giant Pentagon style building called the Donut. Don't laugh, it's the only thing we can afford. Shut up! Cool. Geographical information, basically covert cartographers. It was absorbed into MI3 after the First World War. Three. Was effectively the same as Section 2 until the Second World War, where it was considered European intelligence and was most famously involved in supporting anti Nazi partisan operations. It was absorbed into MI6 post World War II. Okay, so Section 2 and 3, it may seem a bit weird to have two sections doing exactly the same thing. Basically, one section was concentrating on Europe and some wars that might come of, evolved out of there, and the other one was looking at a completely different country, which we were expecting to go to war with very soon. And aren't you glad that didn't happen? I mean, we are. Four. Aerial Reconnaissance and Intelligence later became known as the Defense Intelligence Fusion Center, which sounds like an, an evil villain's lair of some kind. Welcome, He-Man, to my Fusion Center! <laughs> Sorry, that was a terrible skeletal impressionation. I could do better. Pass you, He-Man! My Defense Intelligence Fusion Center shall take care of you! That, that's... That, that's close as I'm gonna get. Uh, this also includes things like Britain's hypothetical defense program, you know, which defends hypothetically against hypothetical threats. Hypothetically. Five. Counterintelligence. Six. Also known as SIS or the Secret Intelligence Service, it was founded in 1906 by Commander Mansfield Cumming! Again, capitalized. He was only known under the codename C or Mr. Cum. The existence of MI6 was denied right up to 1994 with the introduction of the Intelligence Services Act, the Parliamentary Act essentially banning the formation of secret police in the UK and forcing the various intelligence gathering of companies to submit to parliamentary review. This was a consequence of Zircon. But what exactly is Zircon? I'm getting there! Shut up! Don't rush me! Britain prides itself as having one of the best intelligence services in the world, a reputation it has fought hard for, but it is not without its flaws, its controversies, and its failures. Behold, an unassuming bungalow in the London suburb of Ryslip, home to danger ma no, home to a Canadian couple, the Krogers. Uh, Peter Kroger, a very upstanding man who probably wore a lot of beige and smoked a pipe, ran a bookshop. He'd spend most of his life working from home, dispatching rare books to various customers all over the world. In complete stark contrast, his wife Helen was a mad eccentric woman who wore trousers. A woman in the 50s wearing trousers? Oh my, you go girl. I'm a bitch. Feminism. She was described as loud and brash, never frightened to speak her mind, and would often whistle loudly at her friends from across the street. No one paid them much mind, assuming very little of them, apart from the trousers, which was almost a national scandal, until members of Special Branch knocked on the front door of their neighbour and recruited the then unfortunately named... Mrs. Gay Search into a counterintelligence game of cat and mouse worthy of a dramatic 1980s spy movie. And it is a spy movie, it is an actual movie, it stars Helen Mirren, you can go see it, it's great. You see, the Krogers were not actually the Krogers. They were in fact the Conans, an American couple working for the Soviets, running a spiring designed to observe British advances in submarine and underwater observation technology, reduce the pictures to micro dots, and return it to the Soviet Union inside the spines of antique books. It was known as the Portland Spy Ring, and for 11 years it sat completely undisturbed, sending over a decade of intelligence back to the Soviets. When they were finally arrested in 1961, they had expected to serve long prison sentences, but were released just eight years later in a prisoner exchange with the USS of R, being flown back to Russia first class and decorated as heroes and immortalised on a series of stamps. 
To British intelligence, this was an embarrassment. Even though they had received several tip-offs and could have acted as soon as 1957, the Ring of Spies sat completely undisturbed for over 10 years, almost entirely on their doorstep, complete with spy gadgets, concealed rooms, and even a hidden portable radio. In the end, it had been a mole within the Soviet's own intelligence network that had contacted the CIA and ousted the Ring. The CIA then passed that information on to MI5, who placed the couple under surveillance, and found them regularly meeting with a man in London and exchanging packages, tan trench coats and all. It's almost like the Soviets just like picked up an Ian Fleming novel and just went, yeah! That's, that's how we're gonna spy from now on. That's perfect, I love it. I know Ian e. Fleming novels were, were, were based on actual things that were happening and were written much later, but this is comedy, just roll with it. The intelligence agencies took this as a learning experience. They realized the world of espionage they were emerging into was going to be a lot different from the world of the Second World War, where many of the manuals on intelligence and counterintelligence had been written. This was a world where a camera could be hidden inside a shopping bag, a gun inside an umbrella, where enemy spies could be anyone and anywhere. And it was going to be a bit more involved than pointing the finger at the closest person with a funny accent. And so the UK intelligence network was dragged, kicking and screaming, into the 21st century. Investments were made into computing, microchips, wireless communication tapping, mass data gathering, and of course, spy satellites. But Britain did not have an official space agency. Simply put, it, well, it, it couldn't afford one, and when it came to spy satellites, an agreement was brokered between the UK and the US, allowing the use of NSA spy satellites for covert operations. And all was fine until 1982, when something very interesting happened. With the Falklands War looming over the horizon, the UK wanted to use American spy satellites to gather intelligence on Argentina ahead of the planned counter-invasion. However, this time the NSA refused to cooperate. With all their satellites focused on El Salvador, the British suddenly found themselves with no satellite surveillance capability. You betrayed me! How could you do this to me? I trusted you! And this was a problem. Not only was the UK putting on weight from eating all that betrayal cake, while the UK and the US had always had a special relationship, yeah, whatever that means. What had become apparent is that the UK intelligence service could not rely on the NSA should the interests of either not fully align. The UK needed its own spy satellite. But that wasn't going to be easy. The UK had been trying to get its own spy satellite since the early 70s, and while it had managed to get a number of highly secure military communication satellites in orbit codenamed Skynet, a spy satellite was an entirely different matter. Spy satellites were expensive, and the UK just simply couldn't afford one. So GCHQ hatched a plan. They would build a spy satellite in complete secret, launch it disguised as a regular Skynet communication satellite, and all without telling anyone the government, the NSA, or even NATO. The only people who would know were a select few at GCHQ, MI6, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher herself, and the Queen, if she ever asked. Uh, you're not allowed to keep secrets from the Queen, uh, by the way, in Britain. If, if she shows up at your door and stares you in the face and just goes, give me your pawn hat password, you legally have to tell her what it is. It is against the law to keep secrets from the Queen. The budget for the satellite would be hidden within the budgets for other departments and cost around 500,000 Great British Pounds, or 700,000 Freedom Yeehaw American Dollars, or about 2 billion in today's currency if you account for inflation. It was codenamed Zircon, in reference to the zirconian sulfate they used in its construction. Zircon would be a listening satellite, able to pick up anything from long-range radio signals all the way down to walkie-talkies, essentially anything that wasn't a hardwired phone line. Yeah, those those burner phones that you fuckers all buy, thinking that the government can't, can't see you or track you or listen to your conversations? You're wrong. 
Zircon was a top secret project, considered even more sensitive than Britain's nuclear deterrent program. It was to be launched as one of three new Skynet satellites under the name Skynet 4C via the Space Shuttle Challenger. A British technician had been chosen to accompany the satellite as allegedly not even NASA were aware of the satellite's true purpose. GCHQ had hoped to distract the public with a spectacle in the same way that the Americans had used space monkeys to distract from its launch of spy satellites in the 50s, but this turned out to be a mistake. The press gathered around the satellites, hailing them as a triumph of British engineering, as the technician would be the first British man in space. But rather than divert any attention away from the satellite, it actually started to gather some suspicion. The illusion was this was Skynet 4, a military communication satellite, but the illusion was not complete. The defence cuts made to accommodate the satellite meant a number of civil servants had become aware of the project, far more than anyone had noticed. Secondly, a number of open source intelligence hobbyists, you know, those guys, had noticed something unusual. Every satellite needs a ground link, a large dish that points directly at the satellite in order to keep communications with it. For military satellites, this was done at Menworth Hill in North Yorkshire or an oak hangar in Hampshire. However, avid enthusiasts had only noticed two new dishes. Where was the third one? Well, there came another twist. British Aerospace published data on the three communication satellites, all of which would be holding position above the Atlantic. All except Skynet 4C, which would hold position at 53 degrees directly above Russia, and at the same position held by Magnum, America's most advanced spy satellite. The OSI hobbyist exploded, the press became interested, and a phone call by the editor of the magazine The Engineer surfaced in which he was frustratingly told, in a rather confusing manner, that he should not be aware of the satellite's position, that it was classified, and after continuing to probe the question, he was told it was a communication satellite for British forces in Hong Kong. But that answer didn't satisfy, and what was worse, a second press release from British Aerospace quickly followed, this time edited not to include the third satellite or its position. What was worse, it had been obviously censored, with telltale gaps where omitted words appeared. The whole thing didn't add up, and it became clear to even the amateurs that what they were dealing with was a spy satellite. In 1985, the BBC got involved. They were working on a series known as Secret Societies, an expose into the various secret government organisations within the British government, the UK Deep State, if you will, which absolutely does not exist. BBC Scotland would fund and produce it, and for various political reasons, possibly just to annoy Thatcher, famous investigative journalist, ladies' man, beekeeper, and twice voted the UK's sexiest lisp, Duncan Campbell, was brought in to head the programme. Campbell was already known to the various intelligence services through his previous work in the ABC trials, which would take a whole other video to go over, but let's just say he's the reason the CIA no longer operates in British territory. He was a man with a reputation for embarrassing the various intelligence networks to the point where he was nicknamed by MI5, the Destroyer. He's the man most open source intelligence hobbyists think they will someday be, or possibly already are, depending on how deep down the delusion hole they are. I've used that term a few times. so. Let me explain. Okay class, who can tell me about open source intelligence? Well, open source intelligence, or OSI, is the process of gathering intelligence entirely through the use of information available to the public, often looking for stuff that the common public would miss because it's either boring or because it's buried under irrelevance, as it is a pretty common tactic for major world governments to release bad press on days where major celebrities have died, or where one of the royals farts out yet another goblin child, and once again it's the only thing the mainstream media are allowed to talk about for four fucking weeks. Oh, look at this little house! Oh, look at this little face! Oh, it's in a dress! Woo! So yeah, most uh, intelligence agencies will have an OSI department, but a great deal of people, uh, people you do not want to be stuck at a party with, do it for a hobby. These people are known as Oshis, and though many of them just refer to them by their proper name, conspiracy theorists... We have a crisis here. We have a crisis. The country has been physically under attack by the central intelligence agency, and that is going to spill and take a psyop, a black op, a psychological operation against the country. Campbell actually sits on the, the opposite side of the spectrum. Don't mix the two up. There's, uh, there, there's, there's several degrees of difference between Campbell and Sparks. It just don't. So Campbell is hired by the BBC and starts work. The programme is flagged by the Thatcher administration, who expressed concern that information revealed in the documentary may be damaging to her reputation. 
You know, more so than the retention of capital punishment in spite of all the exposés of wrongful convictions, the destruction of the mining and manufacturing industry in exchange for short-term gains leading to the almost India-level wealth gap between London and the north of England, the poll tax, the housing crisis, everything she did to Ireland, Section 28, all those dead children. So part one, Time of Crisis, airs. This is about Britain's preparation for a nuclear war, in particular how badly it would fare, and how a map showing the most likely targets for Soviet bomb strikes was altered to prevent a panic among Conservative Prime voters, meaning Britain ran a worst possible case scenario in which priority targets for the Soviets were mountain ranges, swamps, random fishing villages, and nature reserves. Da! We must destroy British wildlife! Only when every badger and hedgehog has been crushed can we secure ultimate communist victory! I have yet to get in trouble for my uh, terrible Russian accents, by the way. Russians love me. Russians don't watch my videos, it's fine. Part 2, a gap in our defences, showcasing just how ill-managed Britain's development into radar systems were. Which she kinda had a point. I know I love the tornado, but honestly when the Mark 1 was launched the radar was so bad, the plane it replaced, the F4 Phantom, actually had a better radar. They, they, they got a bit better with time. Part 3, we're all data now. Your typical computer scare hype about how all our information will be mass held on computer servers without our knowledge and could be used against us in terms of mass voter manipulation or targeted advertisement. I mean, I mean when would that ever happen? Right, guys? Part 4, Acapo. This is where things start to get interesting. This is in regards to the association of chief police officers, and it's basically all about police corruption in the UK. Again, how is this relevant to modern times? I mean, come on. <laughs> and finally, parts five and six, Zircon and cabinets. While this documentary was being broadcast, the word Zircon was still considered a closely guarded secret, not only to a select few, though a select few were well vetted, and it was believed to be Britain's best kept secret. More secret than its nuclear defence programme, more secret than its involvement in the American SR-71 programme, even had more safeguards than the Queen's personal timetable. When Britain puts something about the security of the Queen, you know it's serious. Even saying the word Zircon could have had you arrested and prosecuted under the Official Secrets Act, and not even the NSA were aware of what the Brits were building. The world's greatest intelligence agency had played its hand. Not even the Russians would be able to work out what they'd done. It was thought no one would ever know. They sat back smugly. Finally, after 20 years, Britain would have its own spy satellite. Reliance on America was over. Until... Professor Sir Ronald Mason, the Chief Science Advisor to the Ministry of Defence, was asked for an interview. Suspecting nothing, he answered questions on the importance of satellites and investment into future space technology, and towards the end of the interview, Campbell flicked through a list of questions and casually asked, What difference to the situation for Britain and NATO will be made by the Zircon satellite? I can't talk to you about that, I'm afraid. You're saying that everything about Zirkin is, is, is classified. Yes, I'm sorry about that. Mason's jaw dropped. Alarm bells began ringing, specially coloured telephones, and people with big important names and titles were being woken up. BBC journalist had just name-dropped the UK's biggest secret, seemingly out of nowhere. An investigation was launched, the BBC had their offices raided, files were confiscated, the BBC was hit with a gag order, and even Campbell had his house torn apart by special police. But by then, the damage was done. The press now knew. The public now knew. And after it had been translated for them, the Americans now knew. It was over. The satellite launch was postponed before the entire project was finally cancelled. The incident remains as one of the biggest embarrassments in the history of British intelligence. Or does it? Because there are a few things here that don't add up. It was never been fully explained just exactly how Duncan Campbell discovered the name Zircon. Sure, it could have been easily guessed that the UK was preparing the launch of a spy satellite, but its name was still a closely guarded secret. That name had code names of itself, and the word was hardly appearing on budget statements, so even if those civil servants knew about the project, they wouldn't know what it was called. And that name itself, Zircon, it generally sounds like something ripped from a James Bond plot. Anyone who's worked with British intelligence or the British military as a whole know they purposely use quite mundane and boring sounding names. Even the call signs of pilots are typically quite generic compared to the exciting ones used by the Americans. Say goodbye to Goose and Hot Rod and say hello to Dave. 
MI6 operations typically followed the same pattern. Codenames for projects had previously included the Sussex Scheme, Garden Shed, the Village Gala, Survey Map, all names designed that, if discovered by members of the public, do not create intrigue or entice people to dig further. For example, let's put you in the classic spy's caper. The target has left their office for a brief moment and you have mere seconds to jump onto his computer and look for anything interesting. You flip through rows and rows of files and you might skip over one called shopping budget, but your eyes would be drawn to something called zircon. And there are other irregularities here. If the satellite is so secret, then how is a regular underpaid civil servant able to publish its position? If it had a cover story, why act surprised when someone asks about it? And why then republish that same information in a way that it was so obviously censored? And then there is the communications dish. If the third one wasn't built at either of the two locations where it should have been, then where the hell was it? People would notice a giant communications disc, I mean, they're not exactly subtle. There isn't one at GCHQ or MI6, or as far as the documentary is concerned, anywhere. There is a theory, though it's just a theory, that the Zircon project never existed. It was in actuality a distraction. MI6 had become fully aware that Britain had an epidemic of bored middle-class retired men to which classic cars and gardening did not satisfy. The age of spy movies and novels had encouraged a generation of mostly men to seek excitement by pursuing an open-source intelligence. And what was worse, they were becoming very good at it and very organised. This was the days before the internet, so most would communicate via secret code and ham radios, leaving ads in local newspapers as messages. And would even go as far as to build themselves secret gadgets and start dossiers on their suspicious neighbours. At the same time, the Watergate scandal had invented the idea of the investigative journalist, and now hundreds of Bob Woodwards were poking and prodding into everything looking for their big scoop. After the ABC trials, MI6 were keeping a fairly close eye on Campbell, and the fact that he'd started filming again would have already sent a few red flags up the chain. But MI6 could have seen this as a good thing. MI6 needed a distraction, they needed a way to turn the attention of not only of all of Britain's wannabe investigative journalists away, but all of the Oshis as well. Duncan Campbell presented that perfect bait. The Oshis saw him as a god, and any investigative journalist would simply take anything he said for granted. He was well known enough to be believed by the press and the public, and egotistical enough to never question what he knew, so long as he believed he was getting one over on the intelligence agencies and the government. And letting slip that he had the nickname The Destroyer, which is in no way a nickname anyone in Britain would ever get, would feed that ego. In Campbell, what they had was the perfect distraction. Their own little space monkey. After all, they've done this before. Meet Paul Benowitz. Uh, Paul lived near Kirtland Air Force Base, which was home to America's Atomic Research and Atomic Bomb Command Center. In the late 1970s, Paul began noticing strange lights in the sky and began picking up weird audio transmissions. Now, of course, these were just coming from the Air Force Base, but Paul was convinced they were extraterrestrial in nature. But being the good American boy, Paul contacted the Air Force to report his findings, who immediately realised that Paul was accidentally eavesdropping on them. Thing is, if they told him to stop, that would have become suspicious. So they did the opposite and told him, well, keep digging. Paul soon became convinced he was speaking to aliens, and he began interpreting alien languages and even reported spotting crashed alien ships up in the mountains. So the Air Force stepped it up a gear. Several officers from the base began visiting Paul dressed in plain black suits, identifying themselves as the Men in Black. They gave him confusing computer software, nonsensical instructions, and even left props for him to find out in the desert. And for years, the strategy worked. Paul and others like him fully believed that the weird signals they were seeing around the Air Force base were actual aliens, not from the base itself. What was better, Paul was not alone. Fake documents, props, and even actual visits from Air Force personnel disguised as the famed Men in Black encouraged amateur Oshis and UFO hunters across America, distracting them from the real secret projects and helping to encourage the UFO myth across the general population. And as a result, even the Soviets were starting to become concerned that the US was actually in secret contact with aliens. Unfortunately, that story does not have a happy end. In 1988, Paul was checked into a mental health facility now suffering from severe paranoid delusions. He would never recover. But for the world's intelligence agencies, the story was an inspiration. They had spent all their time and effort attempting to deceive each other, and the public was simply considered a mere annoyance they wished would go away. But now they could be turned into a weapon, 
weapon of deception and what a better Trojan horse to deploy this weapon than a man hell-bent on exposing them. So while Campbell followed the obvious clues, the real Zircon, codenamed Skynet 4, was packed into the Challenger spacecraft along with a basic TDRS satellite that's uh, tracking and really, by the way, NASA uses them for communication. Uh, that would be the spectacle launch while Skynet would be secretly launched off camera. The US placed a civilian teacher on board as a distraction, the press gathered, the launch was successful, and then… Among the millions of images and files leaked by Edward Snowden was this GCHQ slideshow labelled The Art of Deception. Uh, though we don't have the script that accompanies the slideshow, it references UFOs and UFO enthusiast groups as possibly a way of distracting the public from what is really going on, by sending people down the conspiracy rabbit holes and feeding their egos just enough that the concept they might be wrong not only never crosses their mind, it becomes almost offensive to them. And so they keep digging down the wrong rabbit hole, convinced that every minor detail they find, regardless of how contrived, regardless of how insignificant, is the vital proof they've been missing this whole time. And in that time, four other Skynet satellites have been launched, all with advanced anti-jamming technology, EMP shielding, and with 80% of their bandwidth going through DCHQ, and all can be operated with a satellite as small as this. Of course, that's all just a theory. A game the- no, no, fuck, I'm not fucking doing that. Anyway, now you know what Zircon is. Thank you very much for listening, I've been fantastic. Don't forget to unsubscribe and throw your computer into the pit to stop the deep web infecting your children with the gay agenda. Yesterday I cried. Must have been relieved to see that sucker side. I can understand how you'd be so confused. I don't envy you. I'm a little bit of everything. All rolled into one. I'm a bitch. I'm a lover. I'm a child. I'm a mother. I'm a sinner. I'm a saint. I do not feel ashamed. I'm your half. I'm your dream. I'm nothing in between you and I. Hey, 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 hey,